Well, thank, uh, thank you, Rex, for having me. Uh, thank you all for being here this morning. Hopefully, um, you'll find this useful. I don't use PowerPoint because it's, uh, it's boring, so I'm not going to do that. I'd rather take time to hear from you all and be able to answer some questions. So I thought I'd give a little overview of, of CFSI, our work uh, in this space. I've also been asked to talk a little bit about what's going on in the regulatory space and how that might impact a number of fintech companies. And then we're going to do a little bit of Q&A. So in terms of CFSI, as Rex said, we started in 2004 um, with a grant from the Ford Foundation. Uh, and Jen Tesher, who started our organization, the main question that they were looking at at the time was, how many people in this country are unbanked? So it's really questions around access. Um, and at the time, I mean, people didn't know the answer to that, and many people didn't even use the terms like unbanked or underbanked or underserved. Um, now it's kind of part of the parlance, but that, that was something we worked on for probably five or six years. Um, and now we live in a world where the FDIC, as they just issued their new study, they, they look at this on an annual basis. But this was really important to think about um, do people have access to the, the, the services and products they need in order to live their best financial lives? Over the next five to six years, really a lot of work began around innovation. Obviously, innovation is in the name, uh, the, Consumer, uh, the uh, Consumer Financial Services Inno Center for Financial Services Innovation. And um, a big part of that was we had a fund at the time, which is now Core Capital, uh, which you may know, some of you may Ar know Arian who's here in San Francisco and in Los Angeles. But at that point, we spun that out. Um, and J.P. Morgan later came along and said we would like to fund the Financial Solutions Lab, the idea being how can we help uh, fund and support and accelerate companies that are interested in providing these types of products and services to consumers. And I think even back then, it was still a little bit around inclusion. Um, Maria, who's here on our team, she was here at the very, very beginning, so she could talk more about that. But we, uh, over the last five years, have morphed more to looking at financial health. So that really gets to not the question of whether do you have a product or service, but does it actually provide the support that you need in order for you to go out and live your best financial life. This is a much more complicated question to answer than do you have a bank account or do you have an account, do you have a prepaid card, do you have a mortgage? This question of how do we know that someone is living a more financially healthy life. Um, this isn't point of the talk today, but I would note that in the next few weeks, you will see us coming out with a national survey that we'll be doing on an annual basis called the Pulse. Part of it is we want to get people to move away from talking about just GDP and unemployment and all these other measures of the overall economy's health, but are consumers being able to access products? Do they feel more or less stressed about their financial lives? How much leverage do they have? Um, and so we've done a lot of work there, and we hope that that becomes part of the way we think about all the stuff that everyone in this room works on, which is, what are we doing to address that for all Americans? As many of you know, over 80% of Americans do experience some kind of financial distress in a given year. Um, and almost half of Americans have less than $400 available to them in the event of an emergency. If you just think about that for a minute, that is, that is a very, very precarious situation for people to live in. And the more we understand what are the causes of that and what are the indicators of that would be quite valuable. So that's sort of where we've, we've moved from inclusion and access to a world of financial health. And as part of that, the lab is a place where we express that through both capital and services we provide to firms that are looking to solve this. And with our next cohort, which will be announced in January, to, to reinforce this idea, we have an academic researcher from WashU who's helping us to track over the coming two years whether that the work that the firm, that these individual companies and firms are doing is actually having an impact on uh, consumers who in this case are employees because uh, these firms will be providing uh, services to uh, employees through an employer. Um, these are very important questions. Um, these are not necessarily questions that the private market's set up to answer um, because it's not necessarily your job when you're the investor to always think about this. I think it's a, a fundamental responsibility, but that isn't the system we live in. And so we are trying to move more and more um, toward that. Um, some people ask me, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not really aware of financial health, or how would you, how would you help me think about these issues? Um, this came up at my table uh, earlier this morning, but I would encourage any of you who haven't read the Financial Diaries, 
which is a project that we did with Citibank, uh, that that would be the best place to start. And I'm not just here to plug a book by us, but I, it is quite unique compared to anything else out there. We took uh, families and we followed every single dollar that went in and out of their house for a whole year. Uh, and as many of you who work in communities that are low to moderate income, you know that the financial lives of people as you move down the income spectrum become increasingly complex, very, very difficult to attract, very difficult to understand the choices that people have to make, the risks that they face, because as you go up the income spectrum, the risks that we all face start to narrow and become quite uniform. And so I would encourage each of you, depending on what products you're working on, to think about how can you get closer to that understanding. And as part of that, one of the things I would just note that we're working on um, is thinking more about uh, how do we incubate companies. And one way to do that is to think about how do we get closer to the consumer. So one of the, one of the ideas is do you co-locate an incubator at a place that has a large number of uh, consumers um, who get direct services. So no decisions have been made, but one of the hypotheses we're working on at the moment, and we'll discuss tomorrow, uh, Adam and Maria and I, um, is, for example, in D.C. where I live, uh, the food bank uh, serves half a million different people a year, which is on its face something that should, should be kind of shocking since I live in a metro area that's only six million people. But um, that's a place where you have people with very... Uh, pertinent needs, the kinds of work we do, get you distribution, which by the way, any of you work on startups, as you know, distribution is like 150% of the problem. Um, banks already have that, by the way. They've, they might not be innovators, but they've got distribution down. Um, so that, that's a place where we're trying to get closer to the consumer and see if we could be building products and building companies in the very heart of where people are, are, are living their lives. So that, that's one thing I would note. Um, Lastly, I would just say, you know, we would love to work with any and all of you in some form or fashion through both the Financial Solutions Lab and our broader innovation efforts. So we do work from pre-product all the way up to the largest banks in the world uh, on, on these issues. We have a number of our network members who do this kind of measurement for both their uh, employees and their customers. Um, so I thought now I'd move on to some of the regulatory questions I've been asked to at least pose, and then I will stop and we'll have a little Q&A. Um, so in the last two years, some of you might have noticed that uh, politics has changed a little bit. Um, so that's probably affecting your businesses. Some people it affects your mental health, but it also affects your businesses. Um, so there's a couple things I would point out. Um, I don't think any of them are inherently positive or negative. They're just different, and we don't know how some of them will turn out. For two things, as many of you know, there's now a fintech charter application available through the OCC, which is the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which has got to be the most unuseful name for an agency. I don't think most people know what a comptroller is. They kind of know what the currency is, but they don't know what the comptroller would do with that currency. But anyway, they're the place that you go for, um, for all of the new types of chartering. At the moment, there are people who have applied, but no one's been accepted. We could talk more about why. My personal view is that that is not going to uh, succeed, and I would, I would not expect anyone to actually make it through that process and actually accept the types of terms and conditions that would come with it. Second are de novo bank charters. So that is just applying to be a regular bank. Um, and uh, VARO money has gone through that process. Um, you still have the FDIC, so good luck uh, with that. that that's, that, that's where the that's, it comes down to an insurance fund. They tend to be quite conservative. I used to be a deputy there. So, but Varo has shown that this can be done. Multiple firms have applied. They've, a number of people pulled their applications for a number of reasons. I would say they're all quite, quite different uh, issues that they faced. Um, but the Novo Bank Charter, it's very clear what you have, right? It's a bank. A bank comes with preemption. It comes with deposits. It comes with all kinds of things. Fintech Charter is not clear what it comes with and what it doesn't come with. So we do see more activity happening on the, on the DeNovo Bank Charter side. Um, then, I, then I would point out a couple of other big, big things. Um, one is real-time payments. So as many of you know, um, we're the only major, well, I wouldn't even say major developed country, I'd say one of the only countries in the world at this point that has a payment system that's quite uh, th this, this rigid and slow. So it, takes, it can take up to three days to settle a check, um, which for low to moderate income consumers is an eternity. Uh, that's very problematic. But we have a system that is 
uh, very, very slow. Um, many people, some of, many of whom are in this city, have worked very hard to create, create workarounds so that people can move uh, cash much more quickly. Um, I was with the, the Boston Fed last week. The Fed is working very hard to push forward with real-time payments. Um, in, fed, in fed years, that's probably 2021, 2022, but that will have a huge impact um, for consumers. I think a real-time payment system would be quite beneficial. <clears throat> However, it will be disruptive to a number of the business models that have been developed to try to create real-time payments. Um, as someone who used to be a policymaker, I think there's a public good to having a real-time payment system, and I, I think that that is, that is better for everyone to build off of those rails as opposed to what we have today, but that could be quite disruptive. Um, and there'll be fits and starts, and there will be people in the system who really want that and people who really don't want that. Um, but that is something that the Fed is committed to publicly now and has a Fed governor in, in Lael Brainerd who this is, this is what she wants to work on. Lastly, I would talk a little bit about data, not because data is the least important, but because it's the most complicated. Um, but we seem to be entering a phase where the regulation of data and the use of data, the aggregation of data, who owns data, all of those questions are starting to come to the fore on the regulatory side. Um, so we are going through a cycle where the regulation of financial services seems to be waning. Um, not as quickly as I expected, um, but it is waning. Um, we may be entering the first phase of regulation of data because we really haven't had, other than some rules around privacy, around bank data, the way that data gets used today uh, and who owns it and where it gets moved and how it gets supplemented with other data, it's not something people ever contemplated. And I would just say in my visits to the Hill and with other regulators, this is very much on their minds about whether someone's a data fiduciary, whether someone owns data, um, who gets to decide when to turn data on and off to an aggregator. Um, does an aggregator need to have a series of bilateral agreements or should there be some templated system? Many of you in this room, I'm sure, face this problem every day, but it is something that is coming more to the fore. Um, it is really complicated, and our system of having very, very large banks, thousands upon thousands of small institutions and credit unions combined with a large number of non-bank financial institutions, and then a number of non-regulated data providers makes this a difficult question to answer. And if you go to Washington and you ask who's in, who's in charge, who has a say, Nobody and everybody. So it makes it hard to do the work, but it's something that I'm working on. We're working on at CFSI because this is an important question for uh, us to be able to get toward innovation. Um, so I think with that, um, I'll just give a few concrete examples of where I think um, some of the regulatory changes will have uh, real impact, um, and then I'll stop. So the I, I, I reason I, I stopped with data and real-time payments is I think those are the most pressing issues. At the end of the day, the bank charters and all that really get down to competitive advantages, access to capital, things that are very rudimentary to just running a business. On the data side, um, we saw with Plaid and J.P. Morgan having a bilateral agreement. We've seen a lot of small bilateral agreements from behind the scenes. It's my understanding that uh, the clearinghouse will be coming out with its proposal very, very soon. and so. In 2019, there is going to be a lot of back and forth. And how some of these questions start getting settled really matter. So one of the debates on the table is, if you set up an API that allows you to pull data from a bank, uh, if you're an aggregator or if you're providing a service to a consumer, um, are there going to be requirements about what data you're allowed to pull or they must provide? So for example, there are conversations on the table right now that would allow you to pull transaction data but would not allow you to pull price and fee data. As a former regulator, that's mind-blowing to me because at the end of the day, if a customer doesn't know what they pay for the thing they just bought and they can't compare, that seems like that could be problematic and not, not, as, not as effective as we all envision when, we, when we, many of us set out to do this work. So that is, a, that is a debate that is on the table. Then second is, are we gonna have an API regime that can be rolled out to all these small institutions? So for the large institutions, this is not that difficult. It's a pain, but JP Morgan has 50,000 IT employees, so it, it can be done. As you go down the community banks, I don't know if anyone here is from Fiserv or FIS or Jack Henry, 
But the vast majority of banks in this country, actually their back office, their back end IT is not theirs. They use a core processor. And so as a result, they don't really have the ability to make that decision themselves. And all of the core processors have different competitive interests about how they want to engage with APIs and with outside providers. Um, and so those are going to become more and more pressing issues. And then I would say the other part of this is I increasingly hear um, various fintechs talk about they're gathering data that they don't need today, but they might need for some product they're going to offer in the future. As a former regulator, that is deeply concerning because certain types of data cannot be requested or used um, if you're providing something like a mortgage. There's certain types of information you can't have. There's information you can have to do for insurance, but you can't use it for a mortgage. In the old system, that didn't, this problem didn't matter. This kind of cross-pollinization didn't matter because you, you had a mortgage division. They pulled in the data they needed. They underwrote it. They made a decision. But people are starting to envision where they're going to pivot, and they pull in data. Um, and it just concerns me that under another regulatory regime, that could be problematic for folks. And then lastly, with real-time payments, I think I already sort of spoke to this. It's pretty clear in a world where there's real-time payments, there's a lot of infrastructure that's been built to work around how broken the system is. And that could obviously have an impact on people who are in those businesses. And they'll have to think about uh, how they need to, to prepare for a world where their underlying product um, doesn't have the same value because there should be or could be a public good that provides that. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop um, so that we can get to more back and forth in Q&A. Thanks. So Gary, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I, I couldn't think of anyone better to uh, open up the uh, Financial Inclusion Summit than, uh, than yourself, given your, your prior experience. Um, I wanted to start off by asking you about uh, your prior experience at, at uh, working with TARP and uh, the CFPB. Uh, how have those experiences you know, influenced your, uh, your views today at CFSI? Sure. Well, well, I hope that that talk was helpful. So, uh, um, and I hope that this will be helpful, and I hope to get to see uh, a number of you after this. I, uh, I do have to go around 1.30, but I hope to be able to spend more time with all of you. So actually, when I think about my background, I'm going to give, there's sort of four things that I think about a lot that impacts my work every day. Um, <clears throat> first is how I grew up. I think all of us are impacted by that. Um, I grew up in a trailer park in North Carolina, uh, the first kid in my family to go to college, first male to graduate from high school. Um, and so that experience very much informs my idea about sort of how does the system work? Um, what are the, how does the architecture uh, either amplify or, or dampen the risk that various people face in their lives? I've been very fortunate in that I didn't, ha I didn't stay there. I um, was fortunate enough to get out and go to college, go to work at a hedge fund, go to business school, do all those things. Um, I would say my second you know, pillar of experience is I worked at a hedge fund, long, short, financial services equity um, up until the financial crisis, so from about 2002 to 2008, which was a very crazy time. Um, some of you were probably sitting in other seats who were super crazy, um, but that taught me a lot about um, the inability of uh, capital markets to, mark, to, to, to discipline themselves, um, particularly when you, the way you distribute risk. Um, if you don't have situations where the the people who are um, taking risk or taking risk with their own capital. It shouldn't be surprising that they, they have a different view of risk. Um, I left that to go work on the TARP program at Treasury. So I worked on the auto bailout, did the GM Chrysler bankruptcy, the GM financial bankruptcy, and then the GM IPO. And that taught me a lot about um, crisis management. You know, I went to business school like some of you, um, you know, moral hazard, all these things, blah, 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 blah. Very real, very true, I can tell you. <laughs> When the whole neighborhood's on fire, you don't sit around and like, uh, well, I shouldn't put this guy's house out because he was smoking in bed, and like that really would be a moral hazard. You are forced with the reality of like, we gotta, we gotta stop this. Like justice and all those things will get meted out later or not meted out, but we have to stop this. And that that has had a huge impact on just the way I think about, you know, how we um, have to manage crises and not be over, and this gets to the work around low to moderate income consumers, there's a, there's a moralizing and an intellectualizing that often occurs in a lot of this work that gets in the way of actually helping people. Um, that can occur at the macro level and that can occur 
you know, just people interacting on the street. Um, and then the last one I would say was being at the CFPB and helping build that. Um, got to see how regulation works. Uh, what are the forces on all sides that are um, fighting one another and how that is both um, not really, either side doesn't seem to be grounded in reality often. They're fighting more each other than fighting over the thing you're talking about. But also how important it is to have certain kinds of infrastructure and rules. You know, I'm a big believer that both the financial crisis, but it's also clarity about what kinds of products and services were acceptable and what kinds of products and services we're not gonna be able to compete all the way down to the, to the bottom in terms of you know, what kinds of protections were available or what kinds of transparency were available, that was also helpful in creating some innovation. It's very hard to compete against large incumbents if you can just compete on the lowest common denominator because if you're starting, you don't have enough capital to market your way out of that. But having some very basic rules of the road, I, I, I really believe are important. So those all sort of you know, come together um, for me, and, and one of the reasons I took this job was there are very few places where I could work on public policy and work on what's basically a venture capital accelerator for consumer financial health. Uh, uh, it's a bit of a unicorn job for me, so um, it feels like, and we're also at a moment in time where a lot of these things are coming together, and it gives me the opportunity to do stuff I really care about. Uh, and hope that, you know, CFSI has had impact to date. I think we've done a lot of great things, and we're entering into a period where I think uh, there's even more need for the, some of the stuff we do and for the things you guys do because a lot of people in this country uh, need a, a whole different architecture for how they are able to manage their lives. Um, and that doesn't happen on its own. It takes a lot of hard work by a lot of people. And I think that's where Financial Solutions Lab uh, comes in uh, to f fill a lot of that void. So could you speak a little bit more about uh, what kind of companies Financial Solutions Lab looks to fund? Um, what kind of entrepreneurs you look for that make a, a great fit? So I wish Adam and Maria were up here because you've actually done this. Um, I've been with CFSI for about 100 days, so I will, you know, I will uh, temper my comments with, with that, that amount of humility, hopefully. Um, but we are in the process of renewing our grant for the next five years, and so that is giving us a chance to think about uh, what are our strengths and what we can build off of. I think, I think the first thing we're looking for is is there an idea here or an individual who is committed to building something that will improve the financial health of consumers and that there is a path towards success? Um, we obviously want people to be extremely financially successful because that allows them to have the capital to keep doing the work. At the same time, I've spent you know, eight years at a hedge fund. I had very different demands on me, so I had limited partners uh, who had expectations around the returns that we were going to provide, uh, and things like social impact did not amuse them. They were not uh, so interested in that as part of their return package. Um, but in our case, we can consider those things. Um, obviously, without financial success and without some returns, there, there is no, there is no long-term answer. However, what I would say is there, there are some market failures at the beginning of the process where particularly around issues of diversity, I think the current system fails miserably. Um, if you were to look at the statistics, um, and not to say this in San Francisco, but I'm going to say it because it's true, you know, the vast, vast majority, we're talking three quarters of the founders are either um, graduates of Harvard Business School or Stanford Business School, um, and that about three quarters are also look like me. Um, so if you think about the diversity of issues we're facing, it's highly improbable that that is the only cohort of people who can help solve these problems. Um, and it is not the fault of the people who are innovating. It's just the structure of the way that capital markets work. It's the structure of how education works in America. And we're very focused on how can we do things that um, bring different people to the table in different communities with different life experiences. Um, and that, that I think is, is very different. Um, and the last thing I would say we do that I hope is differentiated is on top of the capital we provide, um, we provide everything from legal to technology to um, design, compliance services, all of that is also part of the program. And then in the coming years, we're gonna become more and more explicit about getting people coupled with the right capital in order for them to go forward. So, um, as any of you know who've ever raised money, um, 
not all capital is equal in terms of its support of a certain uh, vision of what you want to do. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to find the right capital partners. Um, and, and the hope is that if you can find the right capital, either its level of patience or its different definition of what success looks like, um, that can also help support. And I think the lab really very much you know, wants to do that. And lastly, what we want to do um, is to be measuring the outcomes. Because at the end of the day, um, all of us want to be investing our time, our energy, and our money in things that actually work. And that is incredibly hard <laughs> to figure out and takes a lot of capital and time to do that. And that is something that we do, um, we'll be doing more of because, once again, in the private market, I'm not necessarily incentivized to go do um, research to see if the thing I invested in is actually working. Um, doesn't mean people are agnostic about it, but you may have a situation where your financial model works very well. You make incredible amounts of money, but the thing you set out to do for the customer is actually not putting them in a better place, but it could be very profitable. Um, and so we're trying to you know, find that, and the only way you can do that, I think, is by asking some hard questions and starting to try to measure yourself and see if it's working. Yeah, I think the way that you uh, differentiate between your prior experience at Fenway Summer, which is a, an early stage VC firm focusing, or has made a lot of financial inclusion uh, investments versus uh, your experience with the Financial Solutions Lab where there's more of a social impact focus, um, I think is, is, is very interesting. Uh, when you look at a lot of uh, these new firms, how do you weigh, on one hand, you see um, there's a certain paternalistic instinct uh, with a lot of financial firms to you know, we'll manage your money for you. We know better. We know the economics, for example, versus a lot of education and, and doing it yourself. Uh, how do you, you know, what's your view on, on that, uh, that tension between those two philosophies? So, so this is more my personal bias as opposed to where CFSI is. I think they're probably pretty close, but I'll just give you my, my own view. I don't believe in financial education, full stop. And there are probably some people in the room who work on that. Please don't take offense but I, I find it to be um, a highly politicized um, effort to not attack the underlying issue. So I saw this all the time. You could get people, conservative and liberal, you know, startups and incumbents say, yes, financial education, financial education. Everyone would agree on that. But when you talk to a lot of people behind the scene, the vast majority of the financial education that goes on, everybody knows doesn't work. There's absolutely no evidence the vast majority of this stuff doesn't work. But it's very helpful from a marketing standpoint. It's very helpful from a political standpoint because you say, look, people need to take responsibility for themselves. Look at all this stuff I gave them to read. I mean, my God, what else am I supposed to do? Well, that is, that is not something we do in almost anything else in life. So just think about how most of us didn't drive today. I assume most people Ubered or Lyft or capped. But think about if you have a car. When I get in my car, I don't have to, like, know very much at all. I need to have an index finger, at least in my car, I don't need a key anymore. I push a button, okay? When I push that button, a lot of stuff happens. There's like physics and chemistry and engineering, all this stuff's happening. I didn't need to read a manual, I didn't need to understand combustion or how a battery works, I didn't need any of that. And when I pushed that button, I knew that the thing's not supposed to blow up. And when I put it in drive, it doesn't go in reverse, okay? Really basic stuff. And almost every other part of life, we do that. When you have surgery, you're not supposed to understand how a surgeon does their work. You trust that that person has a certain role. There are people who have made sure they have done that job. And you go in and you are the customer or the patient. So we have such fundamental design problems in financial services that the idea that you can educate people out of it is, is just, to me, a real waste of energy and time. Does that mean we can't provide people with real-time assistance with the information that they need in order to make decisions? That's, that's helpful. I'm not, I'm not saying that's not helpful. But the idea that the reason that people have difficult financial lives is because they don't spend enough time reading some brochure from the FDIC, that's, that's absurd. And I think that the, the job is on all of us to design a way for people to have clarity about what it is they're trying to do and what they want to achieve and making sure that the thing that they're using is designed for that purpose. I'm not saying that's easy, but if I looked at the millions of dollars that's spent on financial education, and you took half of that and put it on UX and UI, I think we'd all be in a far better place. 
sorry, there's probably half the room hates me, the other half the room thinks it's awesome, but just putting it out there. And especially when uh, J.P. Morgan, a lot of other large financial institutions, uh, you know, a lot of their revenue models um, are predicated on you know, overdraft fees and things like that. And a lot of the, the, the startups that, that you fund yourself um, are focused on solving for a lot of these issues. It seems that uh, you know, they're helping create a lot of the opportunities that, um, you know, that the firms that, that you're, uh, you're funding are, are creating for. Um, but if we shift gears a little bit, uh, if we look at... Do you want to answer that question? Does it the, sound like there's a question in there? No, no, no. I think, I, I think you answered it already. Um, but if we, uh, if we shift gears, right now we're in the midst of one of the lar uh, longest uh, economic expansions um, you know, in, in, in modern U.S. history. Uh, but you haven't really seen a lot of the gains being you know, shared, uh, distributed evenly, um, in the sense that you know, wages are, are not growing at the pace that you would expect. Uh, a lot of the stock market returns are um, fairly concentrated. What can a lot of uh, you know, these fintech firms uh, do to uh, you know, help uh, you know, rising tide lift all boats? Now I'll, I'll try to answer the other question in, in, in this question too. Um, and I know I've got like four minutes. So um, first I would just tell any of you who haven't read Winners Take All, you should read that book. Um, I'm not going to tell you what's the right answer. I, I don't believe there's a right answer. I think that the mark of a rigorous person is to be able to hold conflicting ideas in your head at the same time. It's, it's all of our jobs to take things that are uncomfortable and difficult and hold them together instead of saying, oh, well, you know, if you're not out there, you know, restructuring the entire society, you somehow are not doing your job. Or if you are, if you are um, doing things around the periphery and you're working on a very narrow, specific problem, you're somehow not being a good citizen. I don't, I don't ascribe to either of those. But I think everyone who's here would do well to, to sort of take on what that book is talking about. Anyway, um, look, I made a choice. I made a choice throughout my career to say, am I going to be the person who goes to the ramparts and, and really fights over a, f a lot of fundamental challenges that our society faces? I think everybody should ask themselves that question. And at different stages in life, maybe that's the right call. For me, I made the decision that there are lots of things that I have expertise in where I could make an incremental difference to something that matters for people's lives. The reality, reality of that for me is, and I think for most of you, is that we aren't solving income inequality. We're not solving the rise of neo-fascism. We're not solving a lot of things that are really, for me personally, are quite scary and very real. But at this particular moment in time, I made the decision that I think the best thing I can do is how can I take my, my work and work on things that matter deeply in people's lives and make that work better for them and be less harmful to them. Um, there may come a time for me or anybody else where that's not where I want to spend my time. But I think it is good to be clear uh, about you know, what problems you're addressing. Um, because I think for some people, I found this in, in my work at the CFPB, there are people who wanted to answer your question around inequality. And if you want to f answer inequality, um, getting people faster payments is probably not going to be satisfactory to you. If you want to make people have better financial lives and be able to better use the technology that we have, then you can do that. But I think that, that clarity is important. I do get concerned that th the amount of um, froth in the system um, and the amount of risk that is being created by this, the governments around the world is, is very troubling. And, and most of us in this room can't create products to, to push back on that. But I think being clear about where you want to where you want to have an impact and where um, where you're best situated to do that, I think that's important. Um, I want to answer a little bit about the question about, and it's similar to the winners take all book about, you know, are you taking taking funds from firms that may be somewhat different, have a different view on on where you should be or what the world should look like. Um, I'm, a, I'm probably a very, I'm an aggressive realist uh, in that, you know, my view is if I can find a way to partner with people to make a difference, then I'm going to partner. If I can't find a way to partner, then I can't. But J.P. Morgan has been a fantastic partner on all of this work. Um, they've allowed us to do fantastic work 
Also, that partnership's allowed us to have conversations with them about what we see and about how big banks undertake certain practices and what impact that has on consumers. Um, but I do think that's something that people need to be aware of because that also undermines the trust that a lot of people around the country have in, in the elite in general about institutions. And so this clarity also helps to say, like, this is what I'm doing. I'm not pretending as if I'm solving all the problems of the world. I'm, I'm trying to, to make a difference in this specific way. And I think one of the areas that uh, fintech firms are, are trying to, to you know, help uh, the common individual is through challenger banks, um, no fees and, and uh, higher uh, savings. Uh, what do you? What's your view as a former regulator on? Uh, you know, a lot of these business models are predicated on they uh, they increase uh, deposit base for community banks. Um, as a as a former regulator, do you see the uh, the banking environment safer because of this? Do you think there are some you know unintended consequences that are going to arise? Uh, as you shift deposits away from, from larger bulge bracket banks to these community banks? Well, from a consumer's perspective, because of the way the FDIC insurance works, um, and almost none of these consumers would have $250,000 in deposits at any institution, the consumers, as long as those deposits are insured somewhere in the system, I think that that's not, that's not bad for consumers. What I will say, where some of these products scare me a little bit, um, is the fragility of the model. Because we don't have real-time payments, you have to do this system where you got five or six counterparties to move money. Um, so I'm not gonna name specific firms, but if you think about a prepaid card, the way a prepaid card works, often the on-ramp is at, say, a CVS. Just so you know, when you put your money down at CVS, there is a moment of time between CVS and where it lands. That's not insured deposits. That's not a deposit, okay? So it's sitting there in some nether world. And then there is a, there's an issuing bank or a bank where the deposits sit. Most of that's a pass-through insurance, so that, that's, that's insured. But the program manager, which the consumer thinks is the one that holds the deposits, doesn't hold the deposits, they actually sit at a bank. And that bank often is small and doesn't have the capacity to do its own processing. So it relies on, on Fiserv or FIS or Jack Henry to do that processing. So what happens is if something in the link breaks, the consumer is like, well, my prepaid card company, give me my money. And they're, they're like, I, I can't, I don't have your money. And they go, what, what do you mean you don't have my money? Your name's on my card. And then they say, well, I'm gonna go to Visa or MasterCard or whoever the network is, not understanding that's just literally the train tracks where the money goes across, but it's not them. And they have to look way, way in the little, like, you know, three point font on the bottom to see who the issuing bank is. And so, in those scenarios, I worry that um, as those grow, which I think have been fundamentally better products for a lot of consumers, in a world where there's not real-time payments, that fragility is, is problematic. And Fiserv, FIS, Jack Henry, all of these providers, they're not regulated. They have no capital. Like if something goes wrong, there's no, there's no pockets. Uh, and a lot of the small banks that issue don't have deep pockets. So I think those have been good products. My bigger concern is that we're becoming very reliant on a handful of data aggregators, a handful of core processors, and that's not, they were, we didn't design the system with the idea that they would be the main clearing houses for increasing amounts of financial services. And this wouldn't be a, a FinTech uh, summit if we didn't talk about crypto at all. So what's uh, CFSI doing on, on the blockchain front? Do you see any applications for improving financial health through blockchain? So at the moment, we're not doing anything uh, very explicitly, um, not because we don't want people to be doing this work. I think that the direct-to-consumer applications are still um, something we have to be very careful and thoughtful about, um, particularly the currency piece versus the technology piece. Um, uh, initial coin offerings that are basically a SPAC, a special purpose vehicle that allows an investor to say, hey, I'm going to raise a billion dollars. I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to invest it in, but just trust me, like, I'm a really good investor. I'm going to raise a billion dollars. And oh, by the way, I'm also going to raise that in a currency that I've made up. I'm not going to use the dollars. I'm going to use this other currency. You could see how that might not always end up in the right place. Just saying, like, that's, that's a place that's a little scary. So that's kind of where we see it a lot, you know, for consumers. I think the question of how can you move money cross-border, between consumers in a much more cost-effective way. All of those things are very attractive. 
On the other hand, one of the reasons that exists is because our payment system is so messed up. If we could get, I'd rather invest the time to get the underlying payment system in a better place and then think about it. I, I mean, I think it could be a fantastic application having come from the securities industry. You really only have five or six players now who own the vast majority of securities in this country or hold them. Their ability to you clear um, amongst each other or with a handful of clearing houses, that, that would bring the cost of clearing way down. That, that, that would be helpful. But direct-to-consumer applications of crypto at this point is not in a place that I feel, I think I'm speaking for CFSI here, I don't think we feel comfortable that that's something that we could go and advocate, particularly for the communities that we're most focused on, that, that people engage with this yet. Because the other thing I would note, no one knows who's in charge. I mean, I live in Washington. Is the SEC, CFTC, Fed, OCC, no one knows. They, they all own a little bit, they think. But whenever you're in that environment, it's also a little hard because you just don't know what the rules are. Gary, this has been great, very informative. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you for having me.